Thank you, Tyler. Appreciate that. Good morning to everybody again. Good to see you. Great to be here. You know, you don't realize how encouraging it is to me to look out and see so many who have come to worship God here at Sunny Slope this morning and on an ongoing basis. We're so thankful for you. And uh, prayerfully and hopefully it's a blessing to you as well. And if you're visiting with us, we appreciate you in an extra special way. We always have visitors with us on an ongoing basis. We never want to take those for granted. You're our special guest, and you are a blessing to us just by being here. And we pray your being here is a blessing to you as well. And to God be all the glory. If you have any questions about anything you see us do or hear us say or teach, please ask. Because we keep saying... We just want to be the church we all read about in the Bible. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. We are in a series of lessons right now that I have just entitled Basic Bible Teachings. These are basic teachings or doctrines, more technical term, but that, that word simply means teachings. We, these are basic teachings of Christianity that we ought to know. In fact, everybody ought to know. They are right from the Bible. They're not from some creed book that mankind has written. They're not from some denominational statement of doctrinal beliefs that they have just come up with and voted on and decided what they want to believe and teach. They're right from the Bible. They're, they're embedded, embedded in scripture. And that's what we've tried to get across through this series. Now, we have been talking about a whole lot of these basic Bible teachings. We simply began with God, with Christ, the fact that there really is a devil, heaven, hell. We've talked about the Bible as our authority in what we believe and teach and practice, and that should be the case in every church that calls itself Christian. Not necessarily so, however. We want to simply be that church and spread that gospel message, the truth of God's word, everywhere all around the world. Now, there is an incredible misunderstanding and in this particular section of our study, we're, we're studying about the church in depth and in detail. We've talked about the church was there in God's plan for mankind before he ever created mankind. Because in his omniscience, ability to know all that's going to happen, he realized we were going to mess up and we were going to need a savior and we were going to need a gospel message of forgiveness and salvation and he designed the church as a part of all of that. We talked about how then it was there in God's plan before he ever created mankind. The church was eternal in God's plan, in other words. And when Jesus walked upon this earth, even though he was going to die on that cross, he said, that's not going to keep my church from being established, Matthew chapter 18. Well, there is an incredible misunderstanding as to what a saint is and who these saints are. You have some large denominational churches that they believe that a saint is a dead Christian. So, in fact, possibly most people who would call themselves Christian would believe that saints are a special class of dead Christians. And so the officials of some big religious groups, they get together and they say, you know, it looks like that around statues of this particular saint or as people pray to these saints, they burn candles to them. What well, they don't call them saints yet. It looks like as there are some statues or whatever and people are praying to these saints that, that some special things are happening. Maybe they would declare them to be miracles, or maybe they would say some special events take place that we can't explain. And so they get together, and they vote, I believe, and they say, we're going to declare that this dead Christian, whatever his or her name is, that they're a saint now. Now, let me say, that is totally made up. That is not in the scriptures anywhere in fact, the scriptures teach absolutely opposite of that. It is totally made up by mankind. I want us to look at what the saints really are, who the saints really are, and what a saint is. So an evolved meaning of the term saint is saintliness. And what we, we talk about there is the idea that saintliness, a person who is extra good in their lifestyle, it would seem, 
extra righteous. I mean, they're really trying to live a righteous life. We would say, that person, you know, that's a saint right there. Or that person, they're just living such a saintly life. And, and, and when these big religious groups who have statues to certain saints and the people will come and they will kneel down and pray to that particular saint. They will offer, they will burn candles to it and offer gifts to those saints. And the thought is, their belief is that the merit of that saint can be passed down to those who call themselves Christians who are praying to that saint. Again, absolutely made up. It is not in the scriptures anywhere. And therefore, it is, and I don't mean this to be mean-spirited, I want us to simply understand the truth. Because Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We are sanctified, we are, we are uh, led to salvation, our hearts are purified, Peter said, in obeying the truth. So we need to know what the truth is, and that's what this series of lessons is all about. Knowing the truth. And so we un need to understand what the scriptures really teach about who saints are, what a saint is, and have a good understanding of what the scriptures teach on these matters. Now, we think about this, and, and most people probably don't really get into this, hardly at all, if ever. They just kind of accept what they've been told, what they've heard people say. But New Testament scripture repeatedly identifies members of the Lord's church as saints. In other words, living Christians as saints and not certain ones within a particular congregation and others are left out, but all true Christians as being saints. We, as true Christians, as the Lord's church, we are the true saints. Now, we need to examine what the word saint actually means in the original language. And that's important for us to understand. And so it means a state of God-likeness called into through God's grace. So it's not something that we decide for ourselves, I, I have this God-likeness. Now we might you know, boil it down a little bit in a more common term, say godliness. But it is, it is the idea, it is the, the lifestyle of God-likeness, but not something that we merit ourselves, not something that we can bring upon ourselves and say, okay, I've achieved this now, I am God-like. But rather, we are called into this God-likeness by God's grace, through God's grace. And so you say, well, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I really understand. How are we called into this God-likeness? The gospel of Christ. As we learn about Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and God the Father as our creator and our, our loving creator and wanting to be our true father from a spiritual perspective and we become Christians ourselves as we're baptized into Christ, we're taking on that life. We're called through the gospel to that lifestyle to become as much as we can be in human form, but we have a soul. And that's our spiritual being within our physical body to be as godly as we can be in the life that we live. So a state of God-likeness, but not achieved by ourselves, in and of ourselves, on our own. But we're called into this state of being, into this lifestyle, into this identity through the grace of God. When we look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, to all, who, who, to all who are in Rome. Now, who's he writing this to? He's writing this to Christians. He's writing this to members of the Lord's church. So he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our, our, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing this to living Christians. And he said, you're called to be saints. He's not picking out certain individuals and said, you know, I think you could be become a saint one day. Once you die and pass on, I think we could conclude you, you have been such a good person, we've got to declare you a saint. No, he's writing this to the living Christians in Rome. And he said, you're called to be saints. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, similarly, 
to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, who, who are with all who in every place call on the name of, the, of Jesus Christ our Lord. All who truly become Christians, he says, those, all of those called to be saints. Now, the word saint also carries the idea of being sanctified. That is to be set apart from a spiritual perspective and also to be holy ones. Well, look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. To the church of God who is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And then Romans chapter 1. Where is salvation found? Only in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And there's the difference between God-likeness and ungodliness. Those who truly live by the teachings of God's word on a consistent basis and a dedicated basis. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, speaking of Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we, can, we must be saved. Now there have been different individuals throughout time since Jesus ascended back to heaven who have claimed themselves, tried to self-identify themselves as being saviors or as being messiahs. They're all false. The only true savior is Jesus Christ. None other fits that identity. None other can be that savior. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. We need to understand that baptism is the only way that we come into Christ. As, and we studied about this in that section during this series of four lessons that we really dug deep into what the scriptures teach on baptism. And so the apostle Paul wrote, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? baptized into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27 also tell us that we are baptized into Christ. As many of you as have put on Christ, or as, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Okay, they're not, the verses are not coming up. Can't get the verses to come up. Okay, you'll get to it. All right, so let's look a little bit further. It is the same way, being baptized into Christ, it is the same way that we come into the church. So we come into Christ through baptism. We also, as we've, we've studied, we come into the church through baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and, and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. And Paul's using that comparison here to our physical body. We've talked about this in our study before this. Yeah, we all have a lot of different members of our body. Hands, feet, toes, fingers, nose, ears, eyes, all kinds of internal organs. But he says, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. God has designed all of those different members of the physical body to come together into and make up what he designed to be the human body, the physical body. But that's just a comparison. That's just an illustration as Paul's writing this that we can relate to you know, from our human experience. And so he goes on and says, so also is Christ. Well, what does he mean there by so also is Christ? He says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. All baptized into one body. Well, we're baptized into Christ for salvation, for forgiveness of our sins. Acts 22 and verse 16, why are you waiting? Oh, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling in the name of the Lord. When we are baptized into Christ, when we come to salvation in him, Acts 2 and verse 47 says, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so what does Paul say there? We're baptized into Christ and we're baptized 
as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his church, into his body. The church is the body of Christ. To be in Christ is also to be in his body, the church. And remember that word sanctified, which means set apart, set apart from the world. I want to read to you a verse of scripture I did not put in the PowerPoint. And this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And so beginning with verse 16, the apostle Paul wrote, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall, not, and they shall be my people. And then he says, therefore, now he's talking about Christians here. He says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. The church is the body of Christ. To be in Christ is also to be in the church. It's a package deal, so to speak. And the church is set apart from the world. Paul said, come out from among them. Now, we're not told to somehow isolate ourselves from everybody else in the world because at one point, Paul said, then you would have to leave the world. You can't isolate. He, but he says, you've got to live that life in Christ, faithfully, obedient, dedicated, on a consistent basis. That's that godliness that we are called into. And that's pertaining to what that word saint means. Godliness, living a godly life because I have been forgiven in Christ and through Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, now we looked at verses 12 and 13 in that chapter earlier and saw how Paul compared the physical body that we live with all of its members making up one body and then he says, so also is Christ. What does he mean by so also is Christ? He says you are baptized into one body, baptized into Christ. Christ adds us to his church and then here in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, you are the body of Christ. He's talking about the church in Corinth, but he's not talking about the true church everywhere in every generation and members individually. So obviously, as we're baptized into Christ, the Lord adds us to the church. So in effect, we're baptized into, the, into his body, the church, at the same time and in the same way. We look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and clearly the Apostle Paul in this particular scripture says, he, that is Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He identifies the church as being the body of Christ, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And then a little bit further, 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Now remember another understanding of that word saint, sanctified, set apart. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the last few verses, Paul says, come out from among them. Don't be like the world around you. And here John says, and we see the distinction if we look closely, He's writing this to Christians. He said, you are of God. And then he makes the distinction at the end of verse 5, they are of the world. Set apart. There's that idea there, that, that principle of what saint is and what saintliness is. All those who are truly in Christ are saints. I'm looking out upon a whole bunch of saints right now because we're Christians. We are the saints. Nowhere will you find that denominational model that has been accepted as a few dead Christians then become saints. That, that's, that's not in the scriptures. We are saints by virtue of being in Christ by being Christians ourselves. All those who are truly in Christ are saints. Now a form of the word saint refers to the holiness of Christians. In Colossians chapter three and verse 12, we read, therefore as the elect of God, holy 
and be loved. Put, and put, put, on, uh, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And then further, we look at Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, holy brethren, who live holy lives, righteous lives, godly lives, partakers of the heavenly calling, call, uh, consider the, apostles and high, the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. We're striving to live a life to be as much like Christ as we, as we can be. You know, the church is the body. And when the people around us are outside in the neighborhoods and across the country and around the world, when they look at us, they're supposed to see Christ in us. They're supposed to be, it's supposed to see the church as being Christ-like, the body of Christ. And that's special for us, extremely special. The term saint is continually used to refer to those in the church, all true Christians. Acts chapter 9, one example, verse 13. And then, then Ananias answered, Lord, now Saul of Tarsus, the Lord had appeared to him on the road to Damascus in that bright light. Not that he saw Jesus by face, but Jesus spoke to him through that light. He told him, go into the city, you will be told what you must do. And here's this Christian man, Ananias, and Jesus says, I want you to go into Damascus. I want you to teach this man named Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias kind of protests at first. He answered the Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Well, you can't do any harm to dead people. To your saints in Jerusalem. Peter visiting the church at Lydda. Notice again the identification here of those who are part of the church. Now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he came also down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. Those were real live Christians dwelling in that city called Lydda. Paul's recounting how he had incarcerated Christians before he became a Christian himself. Acts chapter 26 and verse 10, he wrote, or, or he said rather, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison. Now you don't put dead folks in prison. Many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, well, they were put to death, okay, they must not have been dead saints, as they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 13, Paul instructed how we ought to treat one another, think about one another as Christians, as fellow Christians, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Again, we can't be talking about dead folks here. The needs of the saints and then we look at Romans chapter 15, verses 25 and 26. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Obviously, live Christians. To minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. You see, over and over again. It's clear we're not talking about dead people. Over and over and over again, as Paul addresses his various letters in the New Testament scriptures, he refers to the members in those congregations as being saints. We look at, we look at uh, uh, Romans chapter 1 in verse 7, call, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 2, in the opening address to, uh, to the, in, in these letters, he says, called to be saints. He's writing to the Christians there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. He's talking about living Christians in that part of the world at that time. Ephesians 1 and verse 1, to the church at Ephesus, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Philippians 1 and verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Colossians 1 and verse 2, 
to the saints and, and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Over and over again, he's addressing the Christians within the various congregations to whom he's writing these letters as the saints, the true saints, the true saints. We, the church, our true Christians are the true saints. Now, we are the special people of God. We are the body of Christ. We are the saints that are referred to in the New Testament scriptures over and over again. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, you also, he's talking to Christians here, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. He's talking about the church. Not the brick and mortar, the sheetrock and the carpet and all that. That's not the church. That's a facility. That's a building in which the church comes to meet. You are the church. We are the church. And so he says, you also as living stones, each individual Christian, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then drop down to verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. More literally, that means a people for God's own possession, that you, may proclaim the, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God because you became Christians. You came to God through Jesus Christ. You were baptized into Christ, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are that unique, eternally planned by God, specially, specially chosen through the gospel, set apart, holy people of God, the true saints, the true saints. False doctrine leads people astray, leads them away from the truth of what the scriptures really teach. As, more, as we more and more study what we are as the Lord's church, we come to understand more and more how special is our identity as his church, the body of Christ. We are those whom the world needs to look to and learn from as the true saints, not to be worshiped ourselves, but simply those who have come into Christ, who are now his church. We'd love to study with you if that's where you're at and you say, I, I want to learn more. We'll make the way for that to happen. We'll sit down with you, open up God's word, or we'll make the way for you to be able to study on your own. If you are at the point where you say, I'm ready to be baptized into Christ, as one was last Sunday. We'd love to help you with that right now. Right now. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When you know what you need to do and you're ready to make that commitment, we're ready to help you right then. If you need the prayers of the church, all you need to do is step forward and tell us. We'll pray with you and for you or talk with us privately. But to be in Christ is to be in his body, the church, and there is no separation of the two. We want to help you understand that and become a part of that body. If you need to come, come right now as we stand together and sing.